morning class. So I have already posted the uh, syllabus for the midterm uh, in Brightspace, so you can check that. Uh, the coverage will be uh, everything from the beginning to the previous lecture, not including this one. Homework-wise, it will be uh, from the beginning uh, until uh, homework number three, except for the last question, because the last question requires you to remember some of the formula for uh, random variables. But anything before that are uh, uh, well within uh, your capability. Uh, programming questions will not be asked, so you don't have to worry about the Python questions. You will not see them. Uh, there will not be proofs. Uh, however, uh, I will ask you to calculate things. You do not need a calculator. Um, so that means those uh, computations will be fairly straightforward. Uh, if you ever need to approximate some numbers, let's say 0 0.2125, if you ever need to run into that kind of situation, just say it's 0 0.2. You know what I mean? Okay. If you have 0 0.98725, if you ever run into that kind of thing, just say it is one. Okay. So so, so that is, that is allowed. I'm not going to be that um, that precise about those numbers. Um, and I promise, for most of the numbers that you see, it will be very obvious. Okay. Okay. So that is um, uh, the midterm that will be next Friday in class. So for today's lecture, I want to uh, switch gear and talk about something very practical. So far, we have been talking about random variables, discrete random variables, uh, PMF, CDF, uh, means and variance, and all kinds of mathematical tools. Uh, starting from today, uh, at least for today and next lecture, we're going to look at some specific random variables. But instead of telling you the formula, which you can find them from the textbook and you can also memorize them, I want to show you applications of those uh, random variables. Uh, so that's more uh, for open discussion. So how can these random variables can be used? And uh, you can bring up applications that you have in mind. You can say, hey, would this be, 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 be classified into these random variables? So we can have a conversation like that. Uh, there are a few random variables that we want to study for the discrete case. Uh, for uh, the Bernoulli random variable, uh, the binomial random variable, geometric, and the Poisson. There are more. Clearly, there are more random variables beyond these four. But I think these four are sort of the representatives for the introductory class. OK, so without further ado, let's talk about the Bernoulli random variable. Uh, if you ever wonder what it is, it is con flip experiment. It's very simple, con flip. You have a coin that you have a head and then you have a tail. Uh, there's a probability of getting a head. There's a probability of getting a tail. A tail. What, what, what is the expectation? What is the variance? And we, can, we can talk about all these. Uh, but what would be the application? That should be the focus here. OK, so here is a, uh, the probability of flipping a coin. You have two states, uh, 0 and 1. And let me just remind you, uh, if you have a random variable with this uh, PMF, the expected value of x will be 0 times 1 minus p plus 1 times p. This 0 goes to this state. 1 minus p is this probability mass. Uh, you have 1 times p, which is the other case, so that would be the expectation. That is going to give you p, and this is the mean. Uh, the variance of a Bernoulli random variable uh, with this uh, distribution here, uh, it is the expected value of x squared minus uh, the expected value of x with a square outside. So there is a formula that we derived last time. The uh, expected value of x squared in this case is just 0 squared times 1 minus p plus 1 squared times p. 
that is the uh, expected value of x squared. So you take the square for the state, never take the square for the probability. Uh, then that's going to give you p, because there's a 0 here, there's a 1, and so you have p. So the whole thing uh, is just p minus, uh, this is the expected value x. You take the whole square outside, so you have p, which is coming from here, and then you have a square. So you get um, p times 1 minus p. That is the variance of a Bernoulli random variable. So we know everything about this random variable. We know the, uh, the mean, we know the variance, we know the PMF, we, so we know the everything about this random variable. Very easy, okay? All right, so um, <clears throat> that's just a recap, okay? Um, the, the definition of a random variable, a Bernoulli random variable, is a two-state random variable with uh, state zero and one. Usually, um, the the probability of getting one will be p. Uh, the other one will be one minus p. Um, this is the notation that uh, we'll be using over and over. I say x uh, tilde uh, Bernoulli p. It means that x is a random variable. It's a Bernoulli random variable. There is a parameter, okay, so there is a parameter, a p. Uh, the parameter goes with the state 1. And then after you do this, of course, you know the other state, which is the complement, and so you have 1 minus p. Now, the reason I'm introducing this notation is that most of the random variables that we study, they are parametric family. Uh, by parametric family, I mean that there is a parameter. In this case, the parameter is p. If I tell you p, I tell you it is Bernoulli random variable, you know the PMF, you know everything about the random variable. For a different random variable, I tell you that, that uh, let's say there is a binomial random variable. I tell you this is a Poisson random variable. They are parametrized by different parameters. Okay? So here the parameter is p. It's a one parameter random variable. Some random variables, for example, a normal distribution, you have two parameters. There's a mean, uh, and then there's a standard deviation. You need two parameters to specify a distribution. So again, they are parametrized by uh, a few number of parameters. Now, you can imagine that in many uh, realistic scenarios, there are two cases that will happen. One is the forward process. I tell you the underlying distribution. I tell you the P. I ask you to generate. I ask you to synthesize data for training purposes. The other problem is the inverse problem, okay? where I give you the data, I give you the data, and ask, can you go back and find out the parameter p? Now, this inverse problem uh, is, is sort of the core business of estimation and most of the machine learning problems. Okay? Uh, and so uh, what will happen is that I'm going to give you a lot of these x, x1, x2, x3, all the way to uh, x10,000. I ask you, can you find me the p? Okay. Now, if I only give you one, if I only give you one random variable, I give you one observation, I give you one x, uh, finding, going backward and finding the p is impossible. And here's the reason. If I only give you one x, what is x? x is a Bernoulli random variable. You only see the observation. The observation would be either 1 or 0. You only see it once. You only see it once. It's either 1 or 0. I ask, hey, what is the probability of getting a 1? You only see 1 or 0. There's no way that you can tell whether the underlying probability is 0.5 or 0.7 or 0.2. You need to observe it many, many times. For example, you flip a coin a, a thousand times, then you will start be able to say, huh, okay, the probability of getting hand would be 0.2, something like that, because you're gonna take the, all these um, measurements and then you do some calculation and say, okay, it is 0.2. So when, whenever we talk about the forward process, we start with a model, we start with the parameter, we generate as many data as you want. The inverse process usually it will be that we go backward and say we have a lot of these repeated measurements, and then what would be the underlying parameter? So forward and backward, those are the two questions that we would encounter in any machine learning problem. 
Um, this uh, result we have already proved. Uh, the expected value of a random uh, Bernoulli random variable is p. The second order moment is uh, p. The variance is p times one minus p. So that is uh, what we have shown before. Um, this uh, analysis of the variance we did the last time as well. So uh, uh, when will the variance of a Bernoulli random variable be maximized? When will the variance of a Bernoulli random variable be maximized? Now, we know that the variance of a Bernoulli random variable is p times 1 minus p. And so if you plot it out uh, as a function of p, it will go up and then it will go down. It will go up and then it will go down. And then uh, you have 0 here, you have 1 here. And then the peak will happen when you have a half. So that is the variance. And uh, intuitively, it, uh, it, it makes sense because if your, if your P is 0, that means you will always get the tail. There is nothing varying, so you do not have any variance. If your P is 1, you are always getting uh, the head. There's nothing varying, so you do not have any variance. The variance is maximized when your P is 1 half. All right, now there are different variants of the Bernoulli random variable. This is one of those. For Bernoulli random variable, you encode the head with 1, you encode the tail with 0. But who says that you have always, you need to uh, follow this 1 and 0 uh, definition. You can encode the head with plus 1, you can encode the tail with minus 1. And if you do this, uh, you have a different name. It's called a, a, a Radamacher uh, random variable. And in this case, uh, the two states will be minus 1 and 1. And you can find the expected value of this random variable. And uh, you can find the variance of this random variable. And guess what will happen? Uh, if you take the expected value of this x, where you have um, plus 1 having a probability of a half, minus 1 of having a probability uh, a half, then the expected value of x will be yes, anyone? Which is 0. Okay, it's, it's fairly uh, easy to see because there are uh, two pulses, right? One is minus 1, the other one is plus 1. They are equal height. And so the mean would be uh, center. It will be at the center. Uh, just to be more precise, it will be minus 1 times 1 half plus a plus 1 times 1 half. So that will give you 0. Uh, how about the variance? Uh, let, let's just do it, right? Variance of x. Uh, it will be uh, minus 1. Uh, so it will be expected value of x squared minus expected value of x uh, squared outside. Uh, so the, uh, the, the second movement will be uh, uh, minus 1 squared times 1 half plus, uh, plus 1 squared times uh, 1 half. Um, right? OK, so, so this, is, this is the uh, second movement. And this guy is just 0, as you calculated before. And so what is this quantity? You will get 1. Now, it makes sense because uh, the spread of this distribution is twice uh, compared to a uh, Bernoulli random variable, 0 and 1. Right? So it's twice as big. And so the variance will be, will be twice. Previously, it was 1 half, and this time it is, it is 1. So we can do that. OK, so now let's talk about some very interesting applications. OK, I want to show you two applications that you probably haven't thought about. The first application is as follows. Uh, we all know um, big um, uh, large-scale systems, linear systems. Um, think about the following scenario. You have, a, uh, you have a vector. Everyone knows vectors, OK, linear algebra. You know the vectors. And then uh, there's a matrix. I guess you also know the matrix, right? A matrix is just an array. And the way to calculate this uh, matrix vector multiplication is that you take the first element, multiply the first element, plus the second element times the second element, you add everyone up. Right? So that is called like, the inner product. 
and then that's going to give you uh, um, an output y. Okay, so this system of linear equation is very common. It is so common that um, I would say 90% of the engineering problem will be formulated according to this uh, system of linear equation. Uh, if you don't believe me, if you, if, if, this equation is, has this general form, okay? Um, most of the nonlinear problems, right? Now, in this world, there are only linear problem or nonlinear problem. Linear problem will be following this form. Nonlinear problem, you don't want to deal with nonlinear problem. You always approximate and turn it into this form. Just because nonlinear problems are just too difficult to solve. Okay? And so if, if all the linear and nonlinear problem goes back to this form, uh, you, once you know how to solve this problem, life is good. Uh, you will use this equation for whatever you can call in this in your degree, okay? Communication system, uh, channel identification, it's this problem. Uh, you want to do image processing, it's this problem. CT scanner, it's this problem. MRI, it's this problem, okay? Uh, whatever you want to do, more or less, you can formulate into this problem. So, um, including things that you haven't thought about. How about, how about all this uh, air, air, airplane, uh, air control system? Uh, to be honest, it's this system. Okay? It's again a linear system of equations. Uh, you want to do IC designs, you have so many resistors, where to put them? Linear system. Okay? Just everything is like that. Okay, so now imagine that you are working on an extremely large uh, scale um, problem where you're talking about in the United States today at 11.30 a.m., uh, how many airplanes are flying around, okay? That will be your variable. And then you have a gigantic matrix. I don't know how many nodes are there, but maybe a million or two million. Uh, it will be that scale. You have a matrix of size like this big, one million entries by one million entries. Okay, that is the scale. Now, if I give you a 10 by 10, very easy, you type Python <laughs> times uh, a matrix times a vector, boom, okay, instant. Um, but now I give you a, a 10 million by 10 million matrix stored somewhere on the server. Uh, loading every one by one would take you some time, and then computing that would take you another big chunk of time. How are you going to do it? Now that's a question. You have a big matrix, you have a big vector. How are you going to compute it? Compute this matrix vector multiplication. Then remember the hint is that we are not mathematicians. We are not physics. We are engineers. Engineers like approximations. Okay, so that's a hint. How would you approximate that? Any thought? You have a huge matrix, okay? And you have a long vector, x1 to xn. This is really, really long. This is really, really big. This is really, really big. Okay, how do you approximate that? Okay, so now to, to ask this question, uh, answer this question, let, let's think about the structure, okay? So what is, what is this uh, vector y? What is this vector y? So why there's a vector here, right? Um, the y can be written as um, this. Uh, uh, if you look at each entry of this y vector, right, it would be a row vector times a column vector. But I want to flip your perspective around. Right? I want to flip your perspective around. I want to call this as a1, which is a column vector. It's a column vector, okay? Uh, this is another column vector, A2. This is a column vector of AM. Um, okay, so that should be M. Um, oh, that should be N, okay. So now you have N column vectors, and I ask, how do you represent this Y vector as a combination of all these A column vectors? Now I can do that, I would just say A1, A2, all the way through AN, right? I have all these vectors, and they have 
a combination weights, and the weights will be my x. So I have x1, which is a scalar, times a vector a1, plus a scalar times a vector a2, and then a, a, a scalar times a vector an. So I have a scalar times vector, scalar times vector. Uh, and then I add them up. Now, if you don't believe me, you can, you, can, you can actually write it out. It would be a column vector, another column vector, another column vector, and then you have x1, x2, xn. You're just adding them up. This is the same as you put this column vectors here. And then you have uh, this uh, scalar x1, x2 through xn. That's the same. Okay, this operation is the same as this operation, which can be uh, simplified into, into this. Okay, so now what does it mean? I can go to uh, this matrix. <clears throat> so I can go to this matrix, and I can do this calculation. I can say, okay, y1 is going to be uh, a1 vector times x1 plus uh, a2 vector times x2 plus dot 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 plus xn times an, right? So now I have n of these uh, column vectors, a lot, a lot. Can I just pick a few of them? Approximation, right? Approximation. Appro the spirit of approximation is to use a few of them and re represent the y. So how about this? Can I just approximate it by a subset of these um, of all these uh, uh, column vectors? Can I just uh, uh, right? Can I can just use a subset? Subset. Okay, and ignore the rest. Now, of course, I need to compensate for the uh, proportion. I need to compensate for the proportion. Let's say I take ten percent. Of course, I need to uh, once I get a sum, I need to multiply by ten times. Right, just because I take ten percent. Uh, it's 0 0.1, you need to multiply by compensate, right? You, 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 need, to, you, you need to undo uh, the rest. So there's an assumption. The assumption is that there, there will be some, some distribution along the, uh, uh, the, the, the x1 through xn, but uh, let, let's, let's just do the following thinking. Yes, I have n columns, right? I have n columns. I have n columns. Uh, these columns, they are not necessarily equally important. Right? Let's say, so think about the following uh, scenario. Uh, each column represents a feature. For example, you do, um, you do uh, a graduate admission. How about that? Okay, graduate admission. Um, the first feature vector would be a GPA. That matters a lot, right? That matters a lot. And then the second column would be, would be uh, your, your GRE score. And nowadays, uh, many schools, they're already given up the GRE score, so, so that doesn't really mean much, right? The third one would be uh, uh, how, how many stars that you have given to Professor Chan's textbook, right? So that has no influence at all uh, to, to your graduate admission. Right, so, so you, you don't have to take that into account. So there will be some vectors that are more important, some vectors that are less important. Now, how do we measure that? Well, in mathematics, you can always just say, okay, I, I, have, um, I have this column vector. I measure the, the magnitude. Magnitude, right? Magnitude, I think we, we, can, we can say. You have n elements, you just take the, the, the sum of the squares of all these elements, you sort of measure the energy energy of that column vector, right? Or you can measure the absolute sum of that column vector. So that would, that would give you some, some ideas how, how strong that vector is. So you have some measure, right? And then I can say, okay, this is most important. Um, this is most important, second most important, and then the, the, the least important. Okay, I can rank them. And then for each of them, I can assign some kind of score. I can assign, I can assign some kind of score. And then, what else you can do is that according to these scores, you can, you can design your criteria, you can assign a probability. Okay, so that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Once you assign a score, the score will be from zero to 100. 100 means they're excellent, very important. Zero means that they're irrelevant, useless. 
between 0 and 100, right? So you can assign a probability between 0 and 1. 1 means that I got to peg it. 0 means that I'm not going to peg it. Right? So you can assign the probability. You can say, this one is uh, some importance, 0.9. The other one is not important. Right? So you, you, can start, you, can start, you can go there and start, assign the probability. And then overall, what you should do is that once you have assigned the score, just make sure that the sum, sum is 1. Okay? So what you get, get is say P1, P2, all the way to Pn. Just make sure that when you sum all these probabilities, they sum to 1. Okay, good. Okay. So once you have that, then you can go there and you can start to draw samples randomly. Okay, now you may wonder why do I want to draw samples randomly? Why don't I do why don't I do it deterministically? And now there are reasons. Okay. But let's say I want to draw samples randomly. According to this scheme, when I see a probability of one, I'm I have to draw it. I have to draw it. If I see the probability of 0.9, I will have a lower chance of drawing it. Right? So, so that means that it's giving you a tool to draw samples according, according to your wish. Uh, so if you see the number that's zero, you will never draw it. So now how do you, how do you design this kind of uh, sampling scheme? Well, the way to, to do the sampling scheme is as follows. You have a uh, value, which is uh, y. It, it, by definition, if you do the brute force computation, you've got to do this a and x. You need to multiply every one and sum every one. There's a lot of computation. But I can define this approximator. This approximation is that I'm going to calculate this y hat. And this y hat, you, have, you still have this a and x. But I will have a Bernoulli random variable which is a one or zero random variable. The random variable will, will have certain probability of being drawn. Okay, and this probability is pj. pj is a number between zero and one. So I will have this probability. And now if, uh, if the probability is zero, I'm, I'm, I'm not drawing it. Okay, if, okay, so let me put it down. So ij is a Bernoulli random variable. It will either be 0 or 1. It will have a probability of getting 1 uh, with pj, and then you will have a chance of getting 0 with um, probability 1 minus j. So two states. So given this uh, a1, a2, all the way through an, basically what I'm doing is that I'm going to assign a binary stage to each entry, yes, no, yes, and no, and so on. If that entry has a yes, you're going to sample it. And by sample, I mean that you actually go to your memory, you read out that column vector, put it into your RAM, and start to do the calculation. If it's no, you would just skip that entry. You go to the address bar of that memory, you skip that. You go to the next one. Okay, so the overall readout and then computation is significantly reduced if your p is usually small. Right now, of course, if, if your p is small, uh, overall you're only picking 10%, um, then your approximation wouldn't be that good, whereas if you're picking 80%, you'll be much better, closer to the truth. Um, but given that, um, given that, uh, there is some uh, kind of uh, a distribution of the magnitude of the column vectors by sampling according to the magnitude, you are sort of guaranteed to pick the important ones first. Okay, So this is one usage of a Bernoulli random variable. In fact, we actually use them. We actually use them in terms of sampling uh, important samples. I have a big pool of numbers and then I just assign one and zero according to my belief of how important that sample is. Okay? And then I assign one or zero. Now you can see that in this formula, I have a, ij, and xj, which is, the, uh, which is this uh, uh, inner product, right? a1 to an. Now if you look at each entry, it will be a11, a1n. Right? So, so that would be uh, each uh, 
row vector times this column vector. So you have this uh, notation here. Now you have this i. i will be either 1 or 0. But not only that I have this i, I also have a p. It's a compensation I mentioned. Okay, so you think about that if I have uh, a total of 100% of samples, I only sum the 10% of the samples, then the maximum that you get would be 0.1. You, you wouldn't get 0.2. Now how to compensate for that? You just divide uh, the sum by whatever percentage you're taking. You're taking 10%, you will divide by uh, 0.1. So basically multiply by 10 times. If you take 20% of samples, what do you compensate for? You divide by 0.2 of whatever you sum. Okay, so, so that's the compensation you have. And you can show the following uh, beautiful result that uh, if you take the expected value of this y, okay, expected value of this y, uh, here I have yi, uh, which is going to be the expected value of the summation of aij, xj, ij divided by pj, uh, j going from 1 to n. Okay, a lot of things here, but I can tell you that the only random variable in this equation is this ij. Anyone else is a deterministic scalar. And so if you take the expectation, then the summation can go out, and then your aij, xj can all go out, and then you have the uh, the expectation just on ij, just on the random variable ij. And what is the expected value of this ij? Now we call that ij is a Bernoulli random variable with a probability of pj giving you a 1 and 1 minus pj of giving you a 0. And so the expected value of this ij will be pj. Okay, so then you have the sum of uh, this thing, uh, a i j x j uh, p j divided by p j. Oh, cancel out. Excellent. Then you end up having with this uh, expected uh, sum of a i j x j, which is what you want in the beginning. This is this is your. This is the quantity that you will get by loading the full array, full matrix, full vector, this is what you get. Okay, this is what you want. And then I am giving you an approximator, which has all these Bernoulli random variables, one and zeros, which give you the tool to pick and choose. Okay, yes or no, randomly. Um, but I can show you that if I take the expectation of this random quantity y hat, you are going to go all the way to the end, and then you can show that this is this is why I. This is what you want in the expectation sense. right? Expectation means that you take the average. Um, and so this is actually a good thing. It means that if my n, if my number of samples okay, is big, okay, uh, this n would determine the number of columns. So if I only have uh, a thousand columns of my matrix, then picking 10% may not be that good. But imagine that if my n is 10,000 million entries, picking that 10% is a lot already, right? And that 10% is already a very, very, very good approximation for you. Question here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent question. Why do we want to compensate? Let's do the counter argument. Let's do that. If we do not compensate, let's see what will happen. If we do not compensate, then you have this yi, then you have expected value of summation aij, xj, and then ij without the pj, right? without the pj. Then we can do this calculation again, then the expected value will become, of course, uh, you have summation, j going one from one to n of aij, xj, expected value of ij, then you will have this uh, j going from 1, uh, a i j x j of p j, p j, okay? So now let's make our life a little bit easier. Just assume p j, mm, don't, don't use the running index j. Everyone has the same p, simpler, okay? Everyone has the same p. Then what do you have? You have expected value of y i, uh, i is going to be a sum of a i j x j times a p. 
times a p. That is not the same as the expected value of, of yi, which is sum of a, i, j, and x, j. You do not have a p over there. You do not have that. The consequence is the following. If you do this um, approximator, no matter how big your n is, no matter how many samples you draw, unless you draw 100% of the samples, you will never be an approximation of that because you are suffering from this p. You're suffering from this p. The presence of this p will always make this, this quantity smaller than what you want. The presence of p will make this smaller than what you want. And therefore, by compensation, I mean that you divide the thing by pj, you divide the thing by pj, you divide the thing by pj, in this case, you divide by p, right? Then this, this p and that p will cancel out, and so this quantity would be a good approximator to that. You wouldn't become smaller. If you do not have the compensation, you will always be smaller. Just think about you have, you only sum 10%. If you do not compensate anymore, the, the, the maximum that you're going to get would be 10%. Everyone is 1. You only get 10. Now, if you compensate, you say you only get 10 divided by 0 0.1, then I can go back to 100%. So that's the compensation. Yes, please. Correct. The value of ij is either 0 or 1. Okay, it is a random variable that only has two states, but then the probability of getting it to be 1 is defined by pj. This is, this is really the first time, I'm sure it's the first time that you, 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 you think about, you see this kind of question, this kind of modeling, right? You have a big, gigantic system. How can I use randomness to help you? Uh, then the way that is to do um, binary encoding. You look at each sample and then you say, yes or no, I want to pick it or not pick it. The way to pick it or not pick it is that you assign a probability, and then, but since you assign a probability, you pick a subsample, then you want to compensate. So, so that is the logic behind this. Let me, let me tell you one more story that we did um, uh, several years ago, which is, the, um, which is a problem that we, we saw for um, uh, the, 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 you, you know the depth sensor, you guys know? Uh, when, when you buy this time of flight sensor, uh, you have this multi-camera sensor, you want to measure the distance between the object and, and you, right? Uh, so uh, you, you know how, how, com, how, how computationally intensive is that process? Because think about the time of flight. Time of flight is that you, you send a pulse to the scene and then you wait until it comes back. Of course, it's speed of light, but then you, you have a scanning probe. You go from one location to another location, another location, and it depends on how, how dense is your scene, you need to count how many pixels. Now, um, for most of the scenarios, for most of the scenarios that you encounter, let's say you look at a table, a chair, um, the surface is usually flat. That means you do not need to allocate most of your time in sampling every point of the chair. Uh, by sampling a few points of the chair surface, you mostly know uh, how far is the object. The places that you want to spend more time will be the object boundary. Make sense? Right? So object boundary, you want to have a precise shape. And then within the shape, you just need to have a few samples. Uh, so what it means is that, let's say this is a, uh, a scene, and then there is an object here. Uh, I have a finite budget. In terms of power, computation, whatever you want, okay? I have a finite budget. How should I allocate my sampling probe? Where should I allocate? Well, you should allocate samples, okay? Like that. Most of the samples, they should be allocated around the object boundary. And then a few of them uh, can be uh, in the background in the foreground. Why don't I just go with a deterministic approach? I, I sort of calculate the importance of the edge, and then I do it deterministically. I just uh, assign, OK, this is the most strongest edge I assign. A, I assign a sample there, I assign a sample there. Why don't I do it deterministically? Why, why would a randomized scheme be more favored? 
There's a reason. If you do it deterministically, what will happen? You're going to sort them, okay? And then you go with the, the, the strongest location to the weakest location, and what you will end up having will be this. You will only have samples along this edge. You say, I have 10% budget, you will only allocate samples there. You will never get any additional samples in the flat area because they're, no matter how you calculate, they're, they're, they're not strong. They're, they're, they're not strong edges. So what you will end up having is that you will have only samples along the edges. Yeah, you get very good edges, but then you don't have, even have a measurement of the, of, the, of the background or the foreground. And so by having a randomized scheme, you can say, yeah, this background, the probability that we should uh, uh, sample it will be low, but it doesn't exclude the possibility of picking a sample. So once in a while, uh, along this big, big, big flat area, you can still get one or two samples. Good, right? Because then you have some in the background, some in the foreground, but most of the time you are along the edge. And we, can, we, we design this scheme, and we sample 10%, 5%, and then, of course, we have uh, algorithms to reconstruct the scene, and you can get equally good, and you do a raster scan over the entire scene. So you can do that. Right? Assigning random variable, binary random variables, yes and no, one and zero, Bernoulli, and then do this compensation, do this calculation, you can prove that it works. Very practical application of that. Questions? Good? Yes, please. Correct. It will, will, should the PJ be determined beforehand? We, as users, we need to, we need to define. Normally, uh, if you talk about a big matrix system, we, uh, we usually just go into the uh, matrix and then we compute their, their magnitude. We call it the norm, norm of a vector. We calculate that. Uh, we need to do it once, but once you know the norm of the vector, then the P can be defined according to the norm in whatever way that you prefer. Right? You can say, uh, having this norm, I want to assign higher probability. That, that's the designer's choice. Okay. Now, let me also show you another really, really cool application. Uh, this application is, um, is, is about social network. That's also, if you, don't <laughs> if you can't think of it, it's also a, 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 a Bernoulli random variable. Um, so this is a, um, of course, it's a toy example of a social network where you have many, many nodes. And let's say uh, a, a person A and person B, they are friends. I just draw an edge uh, connecting the two nodes. Uh, so here is um, a relationship between the two. Um, let's say I have a graph. Graph is easy to understand. You have, you have uh, four friends, okay? A, B, C, D, let me call it one, two, three, and four. Uh, one and two are connected. Uh, one and three are connected. Two and four are connected. This is the connectivity of the friends. Uh, you can also encode it using a matrix one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. Four entry, four entries. Uh, and uh, one and two are connected, so you have one here. One and three is connected. Two and four is connected. Okay. Uh, one and one, of course, uh, the diagonal, I don't care, uh, is uh, bidirectional. So uh, one, two and one, uh, three and one, and then uh, four and two. So the rest will be zero. Okay, so that is a matrix representation of a graph. That's called the adjacency matrix. This is called a graph. Uh, in MATLAB or Python, it's very easy. You, you specify the adjacency matrix. You can plot the graph, or vice versa. You specify, well, not, not vice versa. Usually, it's always going from the matrix, adjacency matrix to the graph. You can't go backward. Uh, computers today are not that smart. They can read the graph and then turn it into a matrix. OK, so, um, so, so this is a matrix. Right now, you can see that uh, the ones and the zeros, the Bernoulli random variable, where does the randomness come from? Well, you say 
one and two, they are friends. Who knows how good friends they are? <laughs> it could be that um, uh, they are friends today, but they are uh, they're, they're angry tomorrow. Uh, who knows? Well, so you, you can say there is a certain probability that A and B, they are friends today. And then there is a certain probability that they are friends tomorrow. So you can assign a probability. So you can say this is probability between one and two. Probability between the, friend, the first guy and the second guy. And let's say this is 0.9. That means they, they are, they, they're likely to be friends. They're 0.9 uh, uh, today, tomorrow, and for 10 days. And that means they, uh, they're, they're likely to be friends uh, for 10 days. Uh, so there is a probability. And now you're observing this graph once instantaneously. I just look at the graph, are you friends? And you say, mm, I'm friend. Who knows if tomorrow uh, he, 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 he sort of uh, drives your car, he, he breaks your car, okay? And then and you're angry. It just happens. Um, then, 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 then you suddenly become not, not friends anymore. So, so the ones and the zeros, they can flip. The probability of flipping de depends on this number. And so this matrix itself is a random matrix with a probability underlying that can define it. There are many, many different ways to define a graph, right? So you can specify the, the probability of each node, which would be a little bit tedious. But in the simplest possible scenario, uh, you can have one common uh, probability. You can have one common probability for all the friends. Now, this is not a very realistic model, but it's a simple toy model that says that all these edges, AIJ, they are drawn from the Bernoulli random variable, um, ones and zeros, ones and zeros, okay? There's a probability P that tells you whether this is one or zero. And then, uh, then you can draw the connections. Uh, when P is 0.3, you have very sparse connection. When P is 0.9, everyone's connected to each other. Uh, when P is 0.5, there's some connection. 0.7, you have more connections. Right? So you can draw the connections. So uh, and by looking at the connectivity uh, of the ones and zeros, you can actually go back and infer what is the P. That could be useful for some applications. Right? OK, um, so one more thing uh, I want to comment is that um, I'm not sure if you uh, have seen articles talking about the, um, uh, the friendship connectivity, the, 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 the length or the correlation length. Um, so uh, let's say I, so let's start from me, OK? And then I want to connect to someone, OK? I want to connect to someone, um, some random people on the other side of the world. On average, how many steps do I need to take to reach to that person? Have you guys seen the article describing this? Is that how many steps? So let's say if I want to connect to um, to uh, uh, Mitch Daniels, which is our president of Purdue University, okay, it be one step because I know him. Okay, you know him. Okay, so it be one step. But then how 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 do we get connected to another person? Okay, so you may you may want to take. How do I know? How can I know your your your, your sibling? Okay, then I need to go through you, you know the sibling, right? So, so that would be two steps. So uh, if I want to go to a random person on the other side of the earth, on average, not, not exactly, on average, how many steps do I need to take? Yes. Uh, a little bit more. Yes. Six, six to seven, approximately six. Okay, you take six steps. You, on average, not guaranteed, not, not guaranteed, but on average, you you can reach to uh, uh, any person on the other side of the curve. Okay, so uh, and that can be calculated uh, by doing this kind of analysis. Uh, this is called the erdos rené graph. There are more advanced models uh, uh, stem out from this erdos rené graph, and then you can you can start to do this kind of calculation and show that it is approximately uh, six to seven. Okay, 
So uh, all these are very interesting uh, topics that you will encounter later, and not, not now in your career as you go out and do work. Um, uh, I hope that this is a, the, a moment that, that stimulates you to start to think about, OK, uh, probability is no longer just gambling, flipping a coin. It's actually just even this one and zero probability can be very, very useful in, in practice. Okay, so when we come back, I'm going to show you more examples of other random variables. Thank you.